Good evening, everybody. This is Isabel and uh, Repigal. I am in London. I am at London Glass Blowing Studio, the studio of Peter Layton in, uh, in London near the Shard. Um, the studio is really one of the um, pioneers of studio glass in Britain. And the first thing that I'm going to do is give you a little tour of the studio to show you how beautiful this gallery and workshop is. And then we have the great privilege of having Peter Layton to uh, take us around and show us some of the latest work that they have. So let me switch the, uh, the camera. So as you can see, it's, it's a really beautiful, airy, large space um, where several uh, of the artists are showing their work. This is a place where people come to learn and this is a place where they come to innovate at the back you can see the um, the hot shop hot shop and behind it we can't see it but there's also a cold shop and you can see all the work being displayed here um, it's huge and it is a happy place look at all these colors and these shapes and um, it's it's really a great privilege and it's tremendous so it's collect a week at the moment and um, Peter Layden has decided that he'd rather do it at his own studio rather than at Somerset House. So I'm going to now, here is Peter. Hello, Peter, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Not as warm as one would have hoped. I know, it's surprisingly cold for being Considering you're in a glass studio, yes, I That's agree. That's right. Absolutely, I've got my, yeah. Good, and I've got my coat on, absolutely. Yeah. So, Peter, tell us a little bit the origin of your, uh, of your studio. I mean, you started as a potter and then you became the, um, the, the, the king and the revered, oh, no. the revered glass blower the in oldest. England. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you come to glass? Well, I, I, I've done various things in my life. I started in textiles. I had to do my national service in the RF. Uh, I studied abroad. Eventually, I became a potter. I, I studied ceramics here in London. And whilst teaching ceramics in the USA, I discovered, I discovered glass. I, it was very much the early days of the studio of glass. And one of the, uh, a potter called Harvey Littleton set up began the studio class movement in the early 60s. And one of his students came to our campus. I was at the University of Iowa then. And we set up a little glass studio between us. We built it together, uh, but it was the blind leading the blind. And within a few days, I managed to burn myself so badly, rolled molten glass over the back of my Ooh. hand that I thought, uh, I didn't even realize I just thought, oh God, wonderful cooking meat smells, you know, and then I realized it was me. But, um, but I was hooked, you know. It took me 10 years to slowly switch from clay to glass, but having made that, it was no looking back, having made that switch. Do you yeah. still make clay just for, for fun or not? Not so much. No, no, I don't. No okay. time for fun. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Working the glass is such fun. and. Uh, it really is a full-time job. Uh, having said that, I'm hoping to start a new project fairly soon, and there will probably be some clay work involved. Oh, that's fantastic. It's only in the modeling or mold making and so on. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So um, it's collect, and um, which is one of the uh, the high time of the calendar, the it craft is. calendar. It is. Uh, you decided that it was better for you to be here, it was a bit of space for you to show your work, and also there's the crowd and all these things. It was really all COVID related, you know, that was the problem. Uh, when we showed at the Saatchi Gallery a couple of few years ago, there was plenty of space. Uh, Somerset House uh, is a series of small, smaller spaces, and we just felt that our customers and on those to a large extent would we, we always pick up some new customers too but would wouldn't make wouldn't yeah that our 
demographic wouldn't make the might yeah. want. Yeah. Yeah. So we decided to do it here because it's a large area space. Mm -hmm. It's an, also a very expensive exercise to go to uh, collect. To collect, it is, yeah. So why don't we go and discover some of the works that uh, sure. you have yes. on display? Maybe sure. we can start you with yours. Do a quick tour. And uh, yes, let's uh, let's do that. Right. Maybe you can uh, take us. Well, uh, why don't we? Why don't we start? up? Oh, hang on, uh, Isabel. Could we just open that door for a moment? We have two Isabels. <laughs> we have you and we have our own. Uh, we're just showing you a couple of pieces by uh, a lady or a young lady, I'd say. Everybody's young compared with me. Um, so called Sabrina Kant. These are cast pieces involved weeks and weeks and weeks of work, months sometimes. Very, very beautiful. These are two new pieces and we've already taken one commission for this and we know that of at least one other customer who Things they would like something. It, look, none of these pieces, when you commission a piece like this, you won't get the identical piece, but you'll get something in that vein. So, how does she get this kind of floating uh, effect? Uh, with a lot of difficulty. Uh, effectively, working with a mosaic almost, a little bit like putting together a jigsaw puzzle of many, many pieces. Uh, which she then fuses and uh, effectively, well, we call it casting. So it's put in a mold in a kiln and taken up to a high temperature, kept there for several, maybe a week or two, and then cooled very, very slowly. And then a great deal of cold working, of polishing and grinding and polishing and creating uh, these effects. And in her case, adding the gilding. Is the gilding done with uh, real gold? Uh, I do believe so. I do wow. believe so. It's amazing. It's a nice quality. It certainly gives it a great. Yeah. This is this one is entitled. What's it called? I'm the the sun one. is God. The sun is God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's always a slightly cosmic. Uh, um, element to Sabrina's work. Um, Would you say that uh, glass is a craft that is more about the skill than about, I don't want to say the philosophic intent, but the uh, the message or the well, more I, artistic? I say that was true of, of uh, Sabrina's work because she, she really does have that, uh, I, I call it cosmic, but you, you could almost say celestial uh, vision or element uh, in her work. Uh, it, it is very, class, because of its nature, has to be very skill-based. There's no question of that. Uh, but we, we, we in our studio, for instance, all often collaborate with fine artists and make elements of their work. So. But in terms of, uh, we, we all work with ideas. Right. We, all, we all have a starting point and something, a goal, something we're aiming at. But for most of us, and me, certainly it's true, you know, the journey is, is the thing. Right. The process is wonderful. I mean, yes, you asked about skill. So, so the glass processes are bewitching. They're fascinating to watch and they're fascinating to participate in. Right. And uh, yes, you can get hooked on that alone. And uh, we are, but we are, so there are glass makers who make, say, for argument's sake, sets of goblets. And everyone has to be perfect and all identical. And so that isn't our, that isn't our philosophy. We want to make everything different. Right. Okay. Totally unique pieces. And, um, I say uh, that's a really tough question. <laughs> I, I think I think skill is is an important element in glass art, uh, but of course that may be changing too as people work in a more sculptural vein and less concerned about. Well, look at these pieces of mine. Look, they, these are just fun. These are meant to be fun, and they're they're magnetic. They're magnetized pieces. And the idea here 
is that you can move them around. You can you can uh, create your own sculpture. You know, well, I know. I don't know if that's something that most fine artists would agree to, but I, I like the idea. So I make a group of objects which can, in the past, they've been standing stones. Or in this case, uh, these, are, these are forms based on ferns, growth like. Uh, similarly with these pieces, these platters, which as it happens, they, they, they could be on a surface, on a table, but they happen to be on the wall. We have a, a good way, of, we have a, we've worked out a, a very good way of putting them there. Um, and of course you can create your own composition. You know, I, this happens to be mine, you know, and I'm interested in the negative spaces between the shapes and so on. But some, the person who buys these might want a totally mm. different arrangement. We have a question from the audience. Yes. Um, yes. Sorry, I just need to find it. Um, are there limits in size and weight for shipping, also because of fragility of glassware? Well, we we pack very well. We ship. I I would say. I mean, there are limits. It depends. Look, there are different ways of working in glass. You can blow, and there are limits to the size you can blow. Some some places, some in Turkey or in, in some factories, they can blow huge. Uh, there are limits, we are limited by the size of our equipment and the weight of the glass. I think I'll show you some pieces that I can barely lift of my own that are waiting for coal working. Uh, maybe we should go over there next. I don't know, we'll, yeah, come, we'll come to that. Right. Uh, but we, we, we ship very well and we ship all over the world. Right. So it's not a problem and we welcome yeah, we, we do that with pleasure. Any order. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. So this is one of your uh, your rock stars here. It is, yes, yes. Some of you uh, who live in Canada may know of him. He's called Elliot Walker. He worked here for about seven years. Prior to going to Blown Away, he's now become a superstar. He and won the season two. He did, he did. And if you haven't watched Blown Away, I would recommend watching season two first because it's not quite as brash as season one. We interviewed actually the winner of season one. Did you? Uh, She's quite She's she quite something. Yes, yeah, she, she is. is yes. yeah. Well, it's, I was thinking of her when I said that in a way. <laughs> she uses uh, language quite freely. <laughs> So I noticed that the, there are some details of the, uh, to make the orange slices there. How do you achieve this? Yeah, we, uh, again, look, with great difficulty, I mean, uh, God, we've only got half an hour, as far okay. as I know. I mean, you know, I could talk, uh, <laughs> talk to you about Elliot's work for half an hour. I mean, uh, listen, if anybody's seriously interested in that sort of detail, then they right. need to contact us and, or, or Elliot even okay. and talk about that. But I mean, it's um, he makes these elements, then binds them together, and then picks them up, and then cut, cuts them and polishes them. I mean, they are Elliot is an extremely inventive and skillful character, and these piece, pieces like this still life. He bases these on Flemish. And Dutch painting. So, you know, the, when you asked the question earlier about, well, it's, he is incredibly skillful, one of the most skilled blowers I know, probably one of the best in the world. And, uh, but he's incredibly inventive. Well, let's look at a couple of other pieces. This is, um, this is another, this is a small uh, still life of shrimp. I mean, even even this little detail of the of the um, the pearl, the pearl, I I really like. I think it's beautiful. I could visualize that blown up, you know, twenty times into a really fabulous piece. And he's witty, and 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 there's an element of humor about it. Like, take this piece on the wall. Uh, it's called. Irreverence and and what he's being irreverent about is is Venetian glassmaking. It's a poke at at uh, 
it's actually, it's the answer to the question you asked earlier. It's a poke at being skilled to the point where, you, you know, skill no longer matters. And you've made this beautiful goblet and you smash it or nail it to the wall or whatever you have, you know. I mean, it's quite, uh, it's almost biblical, this thing. It's a bit the goblet and the nail, I mean. <laughs> yeah? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> I've seen cru the crucified goblet. That's yeah, right. <laughs> but here, here's a piece by Louis Thompson, who works here. Um, it's, it's our gaffer. Uh, he's playing with color. The, the um, interior uh, inclusion originally evolved out of him thinking about his own DNA. Uh, I think it's moved along a bit since then. And, uh, but the color variations very carefully thought through. In this case, he's stuck with a fairly basic shape, uh, but, but he is also, his name is Louis Thompson. You can check him out. Here, here we are. He's, he's one of the leading blowers in the country. And, um, you'll see, it's amazing. you see a lot of very, very fine work by doing this. Bruce, this, uh, these are a couple of pieces by our workshop manager, our studio manager, Bruce Marks, who's learnt all his blowing here in the studio. He worked in restaurants before he found us. Like, like so many, he was totally hooked once he uh, got involved in the class. Perhaps you'd like to look at Kate Paswell's work. Uh, yep. Isabel. Kate used to be an architect. Um, I think she retired and discovered DOS making. And this is, she's also an avid walker. These are scenes from, uh, that she's created three-dimensionally in layers. If you come around the side, you can uh, give an indication of how they're made. These are fused and cast pieces um, with precious metals, foils, and gold leaf and silver leaf incorporated into these three dimensional, very, very uh, spatial. She, she creates a wonderful sense of space, in my opinion. So is it a she's is it a slice of glass and she paints on it and then take, does another tranche and is it more, more or less like more that? Less? Yes, that that would more or less be so layered layered. It's a layered build up right. of layers. Yes, but to actually achieve that and to get these these wonderfully evocative colors, yeah, the colors I think is, is marvelous. So this is um, Scarpel, which is in the Lake District. She, she's a great walker, and these are absolutely look at that one there. That's really nice with gold for gold leaf. That's Salon Scarpel, Salon Snow, she said. And then there's almost a book here. Yeah, that's true. Perhaps we go and look at Colin Reed's work next. Sure. Yeah. Colin Reed is a superstar. Have you already moved around this piece? No, I haven't. So uh, this is an amazing piece. So we start here and it looks clear and it's got this rugged edge. And then as we turn around, the glass changes and the blue of the edge comes through. And then you can see how sharp it is. And then it goes back again to clear. It's amazing. So this is a bit the idea of the uh, refraction. Is that what it is? It is. Yes, yes, it is highly refractive. Optical quality glass, uh, which has been cast in a mold. Uh, I don't quite know. I should know what this is. It could be bark of a tree. Um, 
he often uses natural sources for the texture. Uh, probably use copper carbonate or something to get those wonderful icy colors. Really, really beautiful. Uh, Colin Reed is probably the leading glass sculptor in the country and certainly one of the world leaders in, in, in the field. Uh, he's currently got some pieces in the Royal Society of British Sculptors, uh, actually on the cover of their catalog. So that's a great move forward for glass as such. You know, right. Normally there's a hierarchy of bronze and, uh, you know, so and so. And glass is the Cinderella. Right. But, um, <laughs> Shall we move on? Let's go yeah. to going. Uh, some a couple of pieces by Tim Rawlinson, <laughs> who's a rising star, also works here in my studio, very luckily. So there is a complete optical illusion on this one too, or just on the other ones we're going to see? Uh, this is. What he was saying earlier is that this is a yellow and blue to make the green. Right. So he's created the green. But these are these are hot worked at the furnace. Right. So they are well, they are effectively blown. I mean, they are hollow. There is a yeah. they are. It's not really a vessel. Though. So he takes, in fact. Why don't we walk around and concentrate yep. on tin for a moment, just while we're there. So these, you might want to look at these pieces by tin. These are work in pro, this is a work in progress, but these are a couple of his pieces, and that's very beautiful. So I'm going to try to um, show it from the side, so it can, you can yeah. see that it's been cut at a slant. And um, he's, he's very interested in the, the way color and light interact. If we go to this piece, which is quite simple, um, quite a simple piece in at one level, but then as you move around the side, and if I turn it for you, yeah, maybe maybe if I try and turn it for you. Firstly, the, the edge is very wonderful, is wonderful. And then you get this incredible sort of magnification. It's amazing. The warm and lovely organic uh, qualities in the color and the way that it's used the color. This work is very exciting. And um, there's no, no doubt in my mind that he's definitely going to us. He's very uh, intelligent, very uh, dedicated. Here's a nice piece of it. Uh, I think if you, if you manage to go around the back so that you can see the reflection it's really nice. Onto the I'm talking about this. Yeah. I, 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 I love the way. That's what he's, his work is about to some extent. So how many colors in, in reality have we got in here? I think in this piece, we've got three colors, although it looks like the many, many more. We've got this turquoise here in the center, yeah. which is overlapping with a yellow. There's a yellow and there's this red, this orangey pink. And they're not even close to each other. And, and it's just, layers, yeah. And exactly. And just through the refraction and the properties of the glass, and there is creates... huge skill to actually achieve that without huge bubbles in there and so on. I mean, look, bubbles are part of the process. We don't try and get away with that. We're not bakara. Look, the prices are ridiculous. Uh, you know, this one is about four thousand pounds or something. If that were bakara, it would be twenty thousand or twenty-four yeah. or thirty or forty. I don't know. You know, we're, we're, we're a studio, we're not a uh, factory. And yet so, the skills are amazing. I mean, it's, bubbles yeah. add character, in my opinion. They give depth. And here's another piece by Colin Reed, very lovely piece, 
which has had quite a lot of what's called batuto cutting, this texture that you can see. Right, actually, you can see it well around here. Can you see? Yeah. What's going on? So that's fascinating because when we look at it like that, then as we move and look over it, we can see all the uh, the slices. I mean, what's so wonderful it's about amazing. glass is that it's so versatile and uh, you can do so many, you know, the endless possibilities. Just look, look, there we are. So here's another piece of tin. And now we're on something totally different. This is David Ricci, another very well known. Uh, well, uh, leading international figure of, of British sculpt, uh, glass sculpture. And these are lost wax cast from lost wax models. What does that mean? Um, well, the models, that is, model this in wax, prior to making the mold, the original master mold, burn out the wax, then you put various colored glasses into the mold. And in fact, these would be. These sharp bits have been stuck into the mold itself, so that when he casts it, they they end up being part of the uh, part of the figure, yeah, part right. of the costume. But his work often has a message. I mean, these are fairly basic signs, but often he he does metal. You know, he might make metalwork swords or. They, they always have accoutrements and they're always dealing with the human condition in one shape or form. Fairly witty, but there's a message. You know, That's fantastic. What else can we look at? So, but we haven't looked at these, no, two, we uh, these two pieces. We You're quite right. So these are an interesting collaboration between an American, quite a well known American glass artist called David Patchen, who is an expert in the Italian technique of Murini, uh, making small elements, drawing it out into a rod, and then slicing it up so that the pattern is repeated many times. He will then make what we call a cuff. Uh, well, he put it together like a jigsaw cuff or flat, then fuse it into a cup shape, ship that to, to England, where James Devereux, who's one of our colleagues, will turn it into one of these forms, uh, one of his- By heating it up? You oh, will... very much so. Yes, right. it's all done hot. Uh, right. Huge hot worked piece. And what, what James is known for is this hot chipping technique, which is derived from uh, ancient artifacts, you know, Stone Age. Right. Uh, Axe heads, that kind right. of thing. Right. But that's again a very brave thing to do when you've gone to all this trouble to then, when you've got this hot on the end of a blowing iron, you can imagine the weight of this thing, because these are nearly a, a meter tall. Yeah, they're very tall. Uh, you know, to go at it with an ice pick or whatever he uses on the edge there when it's hot. Very, it very either brave or very foolhardy, but he managed it. It's fantastic. Do you want to look at those engraved pieces? Yes, let's do Thomas? that. Because we, we haven't looked at it okay. yet. Um, let's well, go this way. We'll Some more pieces by Bruce. Yeah, very new shape. His work's rather refined, pure. Some more things of mine, which are Related to the ferns, uh, I call them shoots. Another very beautiful piece by Sabrina. And if you look, you can carefully, you can see li little lines in there. Mm -hmm. That's how she has assembled right. all these separate elements. I mean, in this case, there's a, there's a red, sometimes there's no residue of that work, but in this case there is. It looks and like um, a embroidery on glass. It's, it's amazing. It, it is uh, amazing. Really, really subtle and delicate and so beautiful. 
this is actually my favorite piece I mean, of the three. It's very poetic. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Exactly, nicely put. As are these, in my opinion. And these are by probably the world's leading glass engraver, Catherine Coleman. Uh, engraving is a bit of an endangered species. Um, well, I suppose it's carried on largely at the amateur level, but, but Catherine's work is absolutely exquisite. Uh, the imagery is reflected on the interior bubble. It's a very thick and beautifully blown. So it's amber all over, and then she carves that away. And then adds this kind of coral-like, seaweed-like uh, texture. And how is the, um, um, the, the design, the drawing, achieved? Is it applied? Is it almost like appliqué, or...? No, no, I'm sorry, uh, you misunderstood. Uh, oh, which drawing are you talking the, about? The, the color yeah. lizard, for example. Yes, so the whole of this object is coated in that green, and ah, then she has engraved it away, leaving the green areas, which she then textures, and she's added the linear I see. Um, element. But uh, what's exciting? So the green, the green is not paint; it's a coating. No, no, it's, it's a glass coating. A glass, coating. It's glass coating. And she has to have these specially made for her. Each each piece that she engraved is made specifically for her to 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 work her magic. This is a very lovely piece of tin. I don't know if you looked at it. So there's only two colors there, is that right? Or maybe three? There are only two. Only, only two, two colors yep. in this, yeah. Only two, exactly right. But what's incredible is where, where you get these wonderful reflections on the... Yeah, on the it's amazing. And the reflection of the light on the back. It's incredible. We've seen so many amazing things. Oh. So, a couple more things in mind. Uh, and then we're, then we'll be all the way around. So these, what I call cloud forms, not great light, because I've moved and switched them around. But, um, are they the pieces that yes, are, we let's, let's go and have a look at it at the back, so we can see them yeah. before they are finished. Well, these are much, much bigger than those. I can hard, I can barely lift this. This is so heavy. This one's actually got a, a flaw, but um, I mean, this one I can't lift at all now. And so, what's going to happen to these pieces? They are. They will be cut like that. So I will cut this back. Oh, that that might become one of those stitches so over there. This part, but then I will grind and polish that side and underneath as well. I can't turn it over. So maybe this one I can. Oops. So it's, this was where the blowpipe was. So it's a blue with a very soft white over it. These are, these are meant to be kind of clouds. I mean, I'm just exploring the idea of clouds and uh, enjoying it. But, um, so this will be cut back to expose the blue inside. So these have been cut already? No, no. No, these this are, one's these, here. No, no. No? They, they, this is all waiting finishing. Okay. So these will be all ground and polished as well. And again, very heavy pieces. And I haven't, for instance, I haven't decided yet whether this, I'm very, I, I like Georgia O'Keeffe's work a lot and I was very taken with her, her skulls and horns and so on and so forth. But I haven't decided, I mean, it may, may even end up like this somehow. I'm not sure how that would but, uh, you know, I haven't made that, I haven't quite made that decision yet. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, this is more, this is more, I won't call it, I'd like not to call it production work because, you know, they're, they're not churned out by the hundred, they're, they're individual pieces, but they are a of less, a series. Yeah, yeah. Less experimental to yes, maybe? Yeah, yes, Incredible. yes. Uh, well, an experimental use of color in that case, 
these are. Oh, sometimes I've been through a phase where I've been uh, enjoying paintings by various people, and those were Picasso inspired. These are by Elliot Walker's partner, Beth Wood. Some perfume bottles up the top. It's the end of the day for the team. It is, They're yeah. Taking, yeah, yeah. Having just having a little break here. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's Anthony on the right. His work is right at the front. We uh, sit at the front, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Mm. We didn't actually look at them. Well, maybe we should go and yeah, have a look, now. look now. And I think we'll end on this. Yeah. This, is, this is very whimsical. A little message of peace here. It's, uh, it's uh, Anton Scala, who's really become the, uh, the guru of, of bonding, of gluing, of, of precise of precision and precise bonding and gluing of glass in this country. And he's incorporated what's called dichromic glass. Move. Yeah, we can see that as I move the camera, the glass changes color. Yeah. That's a nice shot for long there, isn't it? Yeah. So, so what? Yeah, what I was saying earlier is that it's just, uh, it's just a magical material, and um, we love working in it. We wouldn't be doing it otherwise. You've been under all. the spell for. Yeah. 60 years? Yes, I, well, I'm getting on that point. Yes, almost. Um, no, 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 it's a, it's a love affair that keeps on giving. Really. It's and fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing the love story with us. Oh, uh, it was a real pleasure. It's welcome. a great honor. Really thank nice you so much. Thank you.